Hello everybody, welcome! My name is Ursa Ryan and this is Millennia! Ah, Millennia. It's new, it's fresh, it's Paradox, it's 4X. If you've played Civ 6 or other games like it, you'll like this one. And today, I, Ursa Ryan, am going to continue my mission to teach you how to beat the game on Grandmaster, the highest difficulty that Millennia has to offer. Grandmaster is incredibly difficult, the AI throws a lot at you, it's very fast, it's very aggressive. You're going to need all of your wits to beat it, so today, we are going to be learning about regions and vassals, the differences between them, when you need to use one over the other, and when to integrate vassals and when not to. Follow these tips and tricks and you'll be beating Grandmaster before you know it, or my name isn't Ursa Ryan, and hang on, let me check. My name isn't Ursa Ryan, I have another name, whoops. In order to fully understand when to use regions and when to use vassals, we need to understand exactly what a region and a vassal is in the context of millennia. When you look at the useful overlay on the right hand side of the screen, you will see regions on top and vassals directly underneath them. This glorious city of Ryzantium is a region. Not only is it in the regions section of the overlay, but you'll also see that the borders are solid. They have a little wall. They have no gaps. Unlike this border below, which you can see the little triangles are on, that is a vassal border. You'll also notice if I click on a vassal, you'll get a very abridged little overlay of information there, whereas if I click on a region, you get the full screen. A region is a major city that you have full control over, and the control is the major identifying factor between regions and vassals. I can pick exactly what my region does. For the largest part of the game, and for most strategies, regions are the main sources of both income and domain points, which are the two major economies of the game that you need to worry about. Income is defined as any one of these things. We have wealth, broadly speaking, the gold that fluids and funds your entire empire, knowledge, that pushes you through the game into the tech tree. The more knowledge you have, the faster you tech up. Culture, that fills up the culture meter that lets you use powers. Improvement points, these can be used to put improvements down on the map, like for instance this public school. Production, which you use to build things internally in the city. Currently I'm building some units and I have been building navy. Very peaceful game this one, don't worry about it. Food, that is one of the many needs of your region. Influence, which is a nebulous concept that is applied evenly to all of the territory tree around your region. You can see currently every tile around Ryzantium has 0.31, which will be 16 divided by the number of tiles on my border. And then there are later game incomes like, for instance, faith, electricity. These incomes come from two places. Firstly, the buildings that you put within your regions. You pick these, you build them as you go along. So at the beginning of the game, you can see I built things like meeting halls, libraries, granaries, and eventually we started building more complicated things like throne rooms, museums, and national landmarks. Regions also take an income directly from the tiles that make up the borders of the nation. Now, you can see there's a little bit of a wood here, so it's not quite clear where the region splits with Alex Frost here and the vassal of Orsamaki. But if I go into this panel of Ryzantium, you can see where all my population are working. Some are working farms, some are working trash heaps, others are working sawmills, and you know, there's a lot of logging going on in this city. I like logging in Millennium, <laughs> I can't lie. The important thing is that in a region, you control exactly what happens. What goes on this tile, for instance? Well, I can pick. I can put any improvement I want on it. I can even decide whether or not Ryzantium works that tile or not. And because of this, regions are used to produce large incomes by using chains of goods. For instance, in Ryzantium, I have a farm making wheat. That wheat is then being milled into flour and baked into bread. And that bread makes up a huge part of the food of my income. I've also got very complicated goods like delicacies, cooking oil and even religious text. The second economy that a region directly provides you are domain points. There are six domains in Millennia and they can be found on the left tooltip here. Government exploration, warfare, engineering, diplomacy and arts. All of them have cool abilities and all of them have associated governments and later into the game national spirits. You can see I've chosen ones for warfare, diplomacy and arts but every game is a little bit different. In a region I have full control over the domain points that I make because I choose, for instance, which improvements I put down. A ranch, if I work that, will give me XP 
exploration XP, or the sawmill will give me engineering. I've also put down the buildings that give me all of this domain XP as well. So building the market square, for instance, gives me one diplomacy XP, whereas a lifting tower is a bad example. That doesn't give me anything. The grand theater gives me two arts XP. That's another example. So all in all, regions are a good way of expressing control over the game. You have total control over what goes on, what they make, what they use, what they improve. They are fully your cities. They do, however, have needs. As they get bigger, these needs increase. At the beginning of the game, you just need food. At population six, you need housing. At population 11, sanitation. At population 16, luxury. When you make a religion, you'll need faith. And late game, you'll need things like education and power as well. With full control comes full responsibility, ladies and gentlemen. If you do not provide the needs of your city, not only will it not grow, but it'll also generate for you unrest, and that unrest will become chaos. It can be very bad indeed. Now, one of the advantages of having this full control over a region is you can choose to specialize a city as you want, and this is very much geared up to the style of playthrough you're having. For instance, I, in this city of Ryzantium, have gone very heavily on sawmills, which provides me a huge amount of engineering domain power. But I didn't need to do that. I could have equally focused on using the fish, working a lot of docks, and making exploration XP. Another one of my regions, for instance, is a lovely place called Skeptical Bear, and you can see I've got tons of coal. I could utilize that and use it. RB Hedge, a fishing town. I could make delicacies and all the sort of things out of the food I've got. I've also got marble. You can specialize a region exactly how you like in order to give yourself the domain points you want and more specifically the setup you want. Say you want to go heavy on research, go heavy on research. Heavy on culture, perfect. But either way, you cannot abandon the needs. If you get the needs right, a city will grow every four turns and it will gain a population, which is really good. You can get cities very big like that. But regions do get more and more complicated. Be aware, as you go through the game, the needs become more complicated. As the city gets bigger, they get more complicated. Only take on as many regions as you feel you can handle mentally. If you're going to be the mayor, or the king, or whatever, you need to make sure you're doing a good job. Along with that specialization comes towns. Now, towns can be put in both regions and vassals, but in regions, you have a lot more control over them. For instance, in Ryzantium, I went for two towns, but I've upgraded into level three lumber towns. This means by putting them in huge woods like I have done here, each one is giving me 18 production. And I've got a ton of production coming from the woods. There's a reason why Ryzantium has 331 production. Over here in Soldier in his bucket, I've made a farming town, utilizing some of the ranches and farms that I've put up in order to get a little bit of extra food for my city. So you're getting the idea. Regions are very powerful, they're very flexible, but there are downsides to them as well, namely the culture cost. You can see here that I am getting minus 20 culture per turn from regions. The more you've got, the more culture you pay. Now, culture is a very valuable resource. Without it, you can't make do of any of the culture powers in the game. No culture powers? Well, you don't get any towns. You won't be able to found a religion. You can't get innovation. You can't raise armies or trigger Eurekas. You can't use even the best culture power in the beginning of the game, local reforms. And that culture detriment gets worse and worse and worse. For instance, if I start integrating my vassals into more domains, you can see just this sixth one will change my culture upkeep from minus 20 to minus 31. So that will start to get worse and worse and worse. It also eats more and more government XP to do this. The more regions you have, the more expensive they are to maintain. Broadly speaking as well, unless you go for a national spirit that helps you with this, Mound Builders in the early game is a very good example of something that can do this, or any arts-based national spirit, culture can be quite tricky to get hold of in a large city like this. I'm gaining 16 per turn. Ryzantium is producing a fair amount, but if I go to a slightly smaller region, you'll see I'm only gaining five culture per term. If you overload on regions, your culture can actually go close to zero and you will start never having culture powers in the game at all. So it's a balancing act. You want as many regions you can get away with, but you don't want to have so many you get no culture. However, there are things that mitigate against this. Your government, for instance, gives you a boost to culture for every capital. Again, the wording in Millennia can be a little bit confusing to start with. There is a difference between a, a capital and a homeland. Capitals refer to the cities within regions. So at the moment, all five of my regions are receiving plus two culture. That's good. That's 10 culture per turn. And that helps to offset against the minus 20. So actually, there is a point when you get to the second government. So whipping back into another game, you can see Kingdom, which is a tier two government. This also gives two culture per turn. And in this game, I only have two regions. That means I'm only taking a minus three culture cost and I'm gaining four from my government. So at this point, I'm not actually losing any culture at all. I might as well get more regions. In fact, 
have a look at a vassal. If I was to integrate this, I would go from minus three to minus seven, but my culture would go from four to six. So I would only be losing one culture per turn. So equally, whilst you don't wanna to have too many regions, having too few can leave culture and other benefits from your government, all of this wealth and production and influence, but it can leave that wanting. Now it is also worth pointing out that certain governments and national spirits promote heavy region use over others. In this particular game, I have a setup using kingdom and chivalry. These are very vassal focused setups, but there are other games such as this one I was playing on stream. This particular game, I am using Republic and Mound Builders as a national spirit. This is a very region focused way of playing the game. You can see the region bonuses I'm getting from this government are a lot higher than ones we've seen before. So annoyingly or unannoyingly, depending on how you look at it, there is no hard and fast rule as to how many regions you should have in a game. It depends on your government. It depends on your national spirit. But what I would say is keep an eye on the culture cost. If you're starting to hemorrhage culture because you have so many regions, possibly look to bring that back. If you have culture to spare, maybe start to produce more regions. But ladies and gentlemen, we can only understand this topic fully if we look at the other side of the coin. We've spoken about regions, but now let's talk about vassals. Vassals are the second type of city that you can own in your empire. And on the right hand side of the screen, you'll see them underneath regions. To mention something we spoke about earlier, look for the triangles on the border as opposed to these fortified walls. There are multiple types of origin story for a vassal. Some, like these vassals, began their life as minor nations. These were either conquered by a military force or integrated diplomatically using an envoy. How do I tell that that's the case? Well, if I click on, you'll see this vassal is called Guberman, and I'll go down my list, find it, and I'll see that the integration needed is 20. Only conquered minor nations have an integration of 20. The second place you can take vassals from are cities that you have settled yourself by spawning a settler. They start as vassals rather than as regions. You can tell they're settled cities because when you look at them on the list, they only need 15 integration points, not 20. A settled city is easier to integrate than a conquered one. And finally, you get vassals that started their life as AI cities. Major civilizations, in this case, I believe this one was Germany, that have been militarily conquered. You can tell that these are conquered because again, when I find them in the list, the integration number is 50. These are the hardest to integrate into your empire. After all, you took them via the sword. The populations, they are not gonna like you. This is a classic example. This vassal only just joined my empire. You can see by all the flames and the fact that the enemy armies are still here. Cordoba needs 50 points to integrate. Now, what is integration? Integration is how much time you have to wait before you can bring them into your empire as a region. You get one integration point per turn. So I would have to wait 50 turns in order for Cordoba to become integrated. Luckily, there are ways of speeding this up. You can deploy or spawn an envoy, which I have done into Cordoba, and you can start to integrate faster. If you deploy an envoy into the city, you can see it gets an extra integration point per turn. So currently, Cordoba will take 25 turns, not 50 to integrate. Yay! Oh, that's so much better. You can also spend diplomatic XP to integrate a vassal. By doing this, you give it an instantaneous five points. It's honestly rare that this is worth doing. It's normally better to spawn an envoy because envoys will give you ticking integration rather than just a flat rate. And when you're done with them as well, you can simply select the city and eject the envoy. And there you go. Now they can run off, go to another city and integrate someone else. The button, by the way, looks like this. Simply park them next to the city, press the button that says integrate vassalized territory and bam, a little scroll appears and you're getting plus one per turn. Once a vassal like Major TJ King Kong reaches 50 integration, you can integrate it into your empire. To do that, click this button. You'll pay a large amount of government XP. It's not as much if you have very few regions. It's more if you've got lots. And when you do this, bam, the city now becomes a fully fledged region in your empire. Now I have the ability to go in, allocate my workers accordingly, choose what the city builds. I can even come in and start to put tile improvements down. For instance, this city screams like a sort of city that needs a trash heap. You will notice that the vassal has not met any of its needs. And that's because vassals don't have needs, not in the same way. They have something called region level, a mechanic which effectively soft locks the population cap that a vassal will reach. Regions also have this. It's very rare that you actually meet your region level. For instance, Ryzantium can actually get to a population of 65 if they wanted to. But vassals don't have needs, not in the same way as food or sanitation or faith or anything like this. They work differently. So be careful about integrating. If 
I didn't have a glut of 300 improvement points, I wouldn't right now be able to come along and manually and aggressively fix the city. For instance, I can say, come on, you need some housing. You don't need that tile improvement. Give yourself some proper housing, come on. And we can slowly but surely fix the city. So I can hear you asking. Yes, I know that a city has needs. A region is more difficult to look after and you do start to take a quite large culture hit. But why would I keep a vassal? What benefit do they actually bring me? Well, vassals work off a mechanic called prosperity. Prosperity is a measure of how much a vassal is happy, thriving, economic, contributing to your general economy. If we have a look at a vassal, we will see on the right hand side, it's integration and prosperity number. So Houston, for instance, is in the process of integrating. I conquered it from an AI. So it's only on 34 out of 50 integration and its prosperity is 270%. Prosperity is a very confusing mechanic. It doesn't cap at 100%, which you would think it would. It starts 100%. Every vassal starts with a cap of 300%. That's the absolute limit that prosperity can go at the beginning of the game. The more prosperity a vassal has and the better the resources in the vassal itself, the more income or tribute it will provide to you every turn. So currently Houston is giving me 0.67 knowledge, 0.67 culture, one improvement point and 2.43 wealth per turn. It's not a lot, but the prosperity of this city is not very high. It can still cap out at 300%. So we'll see this go up a little bit and you can see the actual tiles in Houston aren't particularly good. If you click on a tile and then hover the tooltip over it, you can actually see what the tiles give the vassals because this determines the tribute that it gives you. Having a forest in a vassal gives you 0.01 improvement points per turn. That's then increased by 11 times because of my prosperity, which is why it's giving me 0.11. The flax, for instance, this tile grows the vassal. So growth in vassals works based on the tiles they have in them, not anything else. And it'll also give me wealth, again, that has been multiplied by 11 times, roughly, because of the prosperity. If you increase the borders of a vassal, it has more resources, its tribute will be higher. If you increase the prosperity of a vassal, its tribute will be higher. So how do we increase prosperity? Well, it will not increase by itself. It will stay at 100% for the rest of the game. Unless we spawn a merchant, this is in the diplomacy powers. This unit will go onto the map and you can use them just like an envoy to increase prosperity within a vassal. By having this in now, I gain 10% every turn. So in 20 turns, Houston will go from 100% to 300%. In the majority of region-based games, that is the main way you will increase prosperity in your vassals. Alternatively, in the arts domain powers, there is something called promote cultural exports. Spend some arts XP and increase instantaneously a vassal's prosperity by 50%. It's expensive, but it's fast. There are also governments and domain powers that can increase prosperity passively. For instance, the kingdom government you obtain in age three, you have a power called install satrap. This means that every vassal in your nation gains 5% prosperity per turn. Now a merchant gives 10%, so it's at half speed. This applies to every vassal, however. So right now I have five vassals. I'm gaining effectively 25 prosperity per turn split across all of them. It's why New York, even though I haven't got a merchant, already has 300%. Chivalry, an age four national spirit, contains this card, Medieval Medicine. This actually increases vassal population growth by 150%. It's why in my vassal, you can see that having the farm in New York, this vassal should be growing by 0.5% per turn. In 200 turns, <laughs> in 200 turns, it'll gain a population just based on this one tile. That has been tripled. So it's now only in 66 turns. Huzzah! In age five, you obtain a government choice called feudal monarchy, a vassal focused government that has a bunch of things. For instance, manorialism. This is a replacement 5% prosperity per turn, just like satraps in the previous government. Suzerainty. This increases the prosperity cap by 50%. So all of my vassals have their prosperity cap increased and other things Things like stewardship and peasantry, which improve the yields that each tile of a vassal actually give the city. So for instance, if I look at this scrubland, I should be obtaining 0.1 wealth per turn. Because of all these bonuses, because of the high prosperity, because of my government, I'm actually gaining 12.3. That's many multiples of zero above what I should be getting, a thousand times at least. In age six, there is another national spirit called colonialism. Macroeconomics also increases your vassal 
Soul Prosperity Max. So this is why I'm currently at 425% in all of my vassals. I have 300 as a base, 50 from Feudal Monarchy, 75 from Colonialism. Once you start increasing all of these things, the yields of a city can grow up dramatically. Take Corinth. This is a conquered vassal, currently with 130% prosperity. It is obtaining for me quite reasonable numbers. Six wealth per turn, two improvement points, and not even one knowledge or culture per turn. However, by stacking all of the bonuses, if I now go to my 32 population vassal Clint, with a prosperity of 425%, you can see I'm actually obtaining 17 improvement points, four and a half culture and knowledge, and 180 wealth per turn. Vassals take a long time to grow, but once they do, you can obtain some very decent yields. Now, one of the main limitations for vassals is that you have no influence over what it does. For instance, I currently have 47 improvement points, and this vassal, Major King Kong, has improvable land. It's got two sources of game, it's got some tuna, all of which could be improved, but I cannot manually spend my points on a vassal. It needs to do it itself. It does generate its own improvement points, but they come slowly and with time. You can also see that it's built itself a council, an encampment, a work camp, a granary. The borders can expand. The city can produce whatever it wants, but I have no control over what the city builds. For instance, in Ryzantium, you can see all of these builds, aqueducts, seats of powers, libraries, coffee palaces, all of this stuff. But I cannot get Major King Kong to build any of them vassals or entities only to themselves. We have to respect their autonomy. They also grow very, very slowly. Currently, for instance, the only tile, including all of the forest, all of the water, all of the tuna, all of the game, the only tile that actually is increasing the population growth of this vassal at the moment is this one farm. This means that this vassal will only grow every 66 turns or so. It's incredibly slowly. Compare that to Ryzantium, which is currently growing every four turns. So there's a catch. I may only have two regions and I have full control over them, Alex Frost and Ryzantium, but these 21 vassals that I currently have scattered across the map, there's nothing I can do with them. They just exist, growing slowly, passively contributing small amounts of income. Prosperity though is all important. If I look at a vassal with not full prosperity, 0.37 wealth per turn. This one with 110%, 2.3. This vassal with 300%, 9. Huge increments above. So you need to get the prosperity of vassals up to 300% in order to make them decent. If you do that, and if you have a lot of vassals, you will start to see these little bonuses begin to add up to something quite big. For instance, in my empire, because I have 21 vassals, I am receiving 21 knowledge per turn. 11 of that is coming from vassals at the moment. That's half. My wealth per turn? 64 is coming from that. Again, more than half of my wealth per turn. Improvement points? Again, 4.5 from Byzantium, 17 and a half from vassals. And if you work on that sort of vassal income, currently going wide, obtaining as many vassals as you can, and working on prosperity is one of the strongest plays in the mid to late game. To show this off to the absolute full, I'm returning to a game that I'm just about to win. This is an age seven, the age of harmony. I have been working on my vassals quite a lot. I have 29 of them. Pretty much every single one has 425% prosperity because we have gone for feudal monarchy, which increases it by 50%, and colonialism, which gives me another 75%. I've also been boosting the population of them pretty heavily as well. This is why my vassals are so heavily populated. Once you go into the age six national spirit, you can demand fealty, a culture power, but every time you use it, gives every vassal in your empire one extra population. By growing the population, they work more tiles. By gaining more prosperity, they contribute more economy. And you can now see that the same vassal at the late stages of the game, this is now contributing 130 wealth per turn with a bunch of extra yields on top of that. In fact, the yields are so much that vassal economy is almost my entire economy. I have 134 knowledge coming in per turn. Only 34 per turn is coming in from my regions. 72 is coming from vassals. 72 culture is coming from vassals. 1,250 wealth per turn is coming from vassals and 293 improvement points. I physically cannot spend them all. You are capped at 300 and I'm gaining 317 per turn. I physically cannot spend them all fast enough. You can see that in my region, I've improved every single tile pretty much. Whereas in my vassals, well, I wish I could go and improve these. All of these tiles are totally unimproved, but the city is still giving me 110 wealth per turn. It gets even better as well because the tier five government lets you also generate government XP and diplomatic XP from vassal income as well. So currently government XP wise, I am obtaining 
70 government XP per turn. I could not make settlers quick enough. I There is so much government XP that I can't spend it all. I've actually used it all to boost my social fabric up to the maximum of 10. That's, by the way, why my borders are so big. If you're planning on going wide, going aggressive, going a bit militaristic, I would go so far to say that currently, feudal monarchy, colonialism, and chivalry added together, this is probably the strongest play in the game right now. It's not the only way to play, but it's worth bearing in mind. So now that we know all about regions and vassals, we have to ask ourselves, how do I decide whether or not to have a region or a vassal? Now certain play styles are better suited to more regions than others. Kingdom is a tier 3 government that is more suited to vassals, as is the feudal monarchy. Other governments and setups, like I mentioned before, deal better with regions. Things like Republic, the tier 3 government Imperial Dynasty, they work much better with regions, as do things like Mound Builders, Naturalists, God King. There's a lot of different national spirits that work very well with regions. So keep that in mind. There's no solid answer, but there are things that you should look out for. As mentioned before, culture is a major driver. If you are not taking a big culture hit or you have the culture to spare, it is worth having more regions than if you do not. Currently, Republic is giving me two culture per region. That gives me six overall, and I'm only losing seven from having three regions. So in this game, if I had more vassals, it might be sensible to make some. You don't want to let your culture go too low. You want to create towns, you want to get innovation, you want to use local reforms. The other thing to consider is whether or not you've actually improved the regions you have already. Improvement points are quite a limiting factor. If, for instance, I'm looking at the regions I have and I hadn't improved all of the tiles, or maybe they were working on improved tiles, maybe I want to fix these before I move on to a new project. There's no point creating a region that doesn't give you vassal income if you can't then improve it. So right now, for instance, I have 123 spare points. Taking on a new project right now would be fairly decent. If I only had three improvement points per turn and no spare, maybe not so much. The other reason you might want to take over as regions is you want more control. Say, for instance, your setup, like my mound builder setup, is heavily reliant on engineering XP. I might want to take over my regions so that I can put deliberately more saw pits down. This gives me more engineering XP. It means I can also go into the city and make sure I have buildings, such as the work camp built, which gives me engineering XP. Vassals don't do that sort of thing automatically. I also have a strategy. Mound builders have burial mounds, which I have improved to give culture, improvement points, and sanitation. Because of that, I want to spam them, and spam them a lot. By taking over and working more regions, I can make sure that I am using burial mounds every single place I can. Again, vassals don't have that sort of control. The next thing to look at is whether or not you have the government XP to spare. Government XP is one of the hardest XPs to gain in the game. It's very tricky. Very few buildings in your capital provide it. For instance, this seat of power is giving me two per turn, and some governments are better at producing it than others. So, for instance, Kingdom is not very good at producing it, but an Imperial Dynasty is a little bit better. Making a vassal into a region, for instance, if I go and find a Nantes, this is integrated fully, it's ready to go. It would cost me 38 government XP in order to integrate it. Now, I've got the government XP at the moment, and looking through my kingdom, there's nothing I really want to spend on. I'm not really after envoys or immortals or even reaping scuttage, and I'm not in the mood to make settlers given the fact that I've already got 23 vassals. I just don't need them. So in this case, I do have the government XP. It would be probably worth integrating this in. However, it's also really close to my other region. You do not want to build your regions too close to each other because they get big. You saw Ryzantium in my previous game. It was massive. The borders expand, especially later into the game. So maybe over here on this coast, the city of Argos might be a better pick. It's, it's quite far away. It's got loads of room to expand into and a bunch of resources. I have a look at the culture situation. I'm currently losing three. My government gives me two culture per city and I would lose four. So I'm only losing two culture per turn against 29 culture. This seems like a pretty good trade-off. This is not a bad idea for a city. Let's have a look at improvement points. I have 83 per turn. Now that is currently a little higher than it should be because I'm running the levy workers project. But if I were to upgrade to a workshop, you can see that goes to 22 per turn. The two regions I have, broadly speaking, are fully improved. So right now, I would have improvement points to spend on Argos. This, to me, looks like a really good candidate for integration. So here we go. It's here. The other thing to consider is whether or not integrating would be a huge loss of income for you. This vassal is gaining me 12 wealth, some science, some culture, and some improvement points per turn. You'll lose all that income if I was to integrate it. So make sure you can afford that loss 
boss. I have also just integrated a city with three population. Now, a city will only grow every four turns. This is going to be quite a long time before we get anywhere near the population size of Ologna. So maybe in this case, it would have been better to wait for this conquered city, which is currently at 44 integration per turn, to fully integrate. This would have 10 population. That extra seven pop would have saved me 28 turns of growth. It also has a town. That saves me a culture power because I don't need to build one. AI did all the work for me. I might as well use it. The balance is always a little trickier than you might think, but you can find it as well. Because now if I were to integrate Nantes, my fourth, you can see that would be a minus five culture upkeep. So I would lose another three culture per turn. And that's gone from 30 something government XP to 57. So now it's getting more and more expensive. I'm now beginning to lose a significant chunk of culture. The next, that's 85 government XP. My advice to you, especially on Grandmaster difficulty, is don't make too many regions too quickly. Make sure you can afford them. Make sure you look at it. Because don't get me wrong, this is a super city. And if I had four of these with 152 production, well, my empire would be unstoppable. But make sure you have the points to do it. Later into the game, it is much quicker to make a region into something powerful because you'll have the improvement points to do it. There's nothing worse than integrating too quickly and realizing that I've got two new cities that I have direct control over that have no ways of being happy. My last piece of advice, be very careful about getting more regions whilst you're still on the tribal government. The tribal government is all about homeland bonuses. Homeland only, remember, applies to your first city, not any subsequent region. So if I was to take over Taxilla, I would gain a couple of improvements, but not many. Age three is a really good time to start making regions. But there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Grandmaster will throw you many curveballs in millennia, but hopefully I've given you some knowledge about regions and vassals and when to use them and when to abuse them. If you've got any pieces of advice or if there's anything you want to build on, let me know in the comments. All of that sort of feedback is always very welcome. After all, we're all learning this game together. Let me also know if you want to see more of these sorts of guides. Always happy to make them, always happy to share what I know. Thank you all so much for watching. Go about your day and be merry. I've been Ursa Ryan. See you all next time. Goodbye. And finally, a very special shout out goes to Glorious Petra, Matthew Wilkinson, Paul Coffey, Portland, Clint Hennis, Scott Stratton, Major King Kong, Skeptical Bear, Cinnamon Beard, Radiatore, Private Selection, Genoa Salami, Callum Billy, Garrett Gowan, Polar Bear Ray, El Truant, Creston, RB Hedge, Mushkin Mandeltort, Diebel Time, Burial, I'm Daft, Gooberman, Dr. Bobby, Polar Waller Bear, Mixomatosis, NTG Golfman, Victor McPupster, Indigenous 68, Technology Poet, Teddy Zersa, Zaf, Barnaby Rex, Sharky Bates, Charlie Bears, Flying Dutch Burbs, Nate the Great, Alex Frost, Joseph Bianconi, Interplanet Janet, Mr. Awesome, Frankincense Battlesword, Sleepy Lab, Bukaluk79. Thank you everyone for your support. See you all in the next video. Goodbye.